Good morning everyone. Today let's talk about the basic adjunct or the most important adjunct for a dental physician in a daily day-to-day -day practice that is the radiation. Today we'll be uh, talking about the physics or the principles governing the x-ray production, its usage in taking x-ray films and how it, how it actually these x-rays uh, produce the images onto the uh, x-ray film. So before, before we, uh, we, we move on to the main uh, subject, uh, brief history, we all know that it was uh, X-rays were first discovered by William Rontgen in uh, 1980, uh, 1895. And the first X-ray film which was taken was upon his wife's hand. And uh, what the inference he drew from it was these invisible rays, which he named it as X-rays, could pass through less dense, uh, uh, less dense uh, objects Whereas dense objects like bones or uh, metals uh, completely stop this uh, pro uh, propagation of these invisible or X-rays. This was the most uh, uh, the first X-ray tube which was used by William Rontgen. Later, it was uh, more developed by uh, Coolidge, which gave us the most uh, accepted and most highly used uh, X-ray tube in the recent times. Uh, in perspective to dental radiography, it was Otto Walkoff, a dentist in Germany, who first uh, produced these uh, X-rays and uh, uh, made made use of these X-rays in a dental uh, preview. The first X-rays which were taken was uh, the posterior X-rays of a patient, which was incidentally just few months after these X-rays were uh, uh, discovered by Rongen. Now, before we move on to the main uh, subject as to how X-rays are produced, we need to have a basic knowledge about the structure of atom and how the, the different uh, uh, placements of these uh, particles within an atom is important, how this is important in the production of X-rays. As we all know, the structure of atom was first uh, given by Neil Bohr in uh, 1913, wherein he said the center core was made of uh, neutrons, which uh, have a a single uh, which was which were the most heaviest particles in an atom and carried no charge it was neutral they, it also uh, uh, has protons in the core uh, which has a positive charge with a mass of plus 1 and around in the various shells as you can see in this uh, schematic diagram the various shells were named as k l m n and so on from the innermost to the outermost orbits and these orbits have the, have the negatively charged electrons revolving around them. As you know, the most innermost orbit contain, has the uh, most stable electrons with the least amount of binding energy. Now, binding energy is a concept wherein we, uh, we use this term to denote any particular energy which is used or which is necessary to hold these electrons within their orbits. So, as you can see, as the distance progresses from the core, to the outside, from the innermost orbit to the outermost orbit, this binding energy increases. Now, in any uh, such uh, scenario wherein the binding energy increases, there is more amount of energy which is needed to hold these electrons within their place, then the uh, electron is said to be slightly instable, unstable, when compared to the electrons which are in the innermost orbits. Now, another concept which is uh, necessary or which is uh, most useful in the production of X-rays is ionization. Now, ionization is any process which creates an ion. Now, ion may be uh, negatively charged or a positively charged depending upon whether it has uh, gained an electron or it has lost an electron. Now, we all know the atom is more stable in its neutral state. Now, every atom is, uh, since it has equal number of electrons and protons, the net charge uh, considering that neutrons don't have any charge, the net charge is zero. Now, in an ion, when it gains an electron, it has an extra negative charge. It becomes a negative ion. Now, in case where it loses an electron, it becomes a uh, positively charged ion because it has one extra proton. Now, as you can see in this schematic diagram, a gain of an electron uh, makes it a negative ion, whereas a loss of an electron makes it a positive ion. So, radiation, what exactly is radiation? Radiation is nothing but transmission of energy via waves or particles within space or matter. Now, this emission and propagation of this energy is called radiation. Now, these radiations can be defined or uh, broadly classified as two types. One is an ionizing radiation, whereas wherein this radiation, be it a particulate radiation or a wave energy, which is uh, transmitting, has a capability to produce ions in the space or in the matter through which it is propagating. Now, the other type of our waves is a non-ionizing where it doesn't have any effect on the surrounding structures and it doesn't produce any ionization. 
Now, in the ionization radiation itself, there are again uh, two types, uh, particulate radiation and electromagnetic radiation. As I said, radiation itself is transmission of uh, energy via particles or via waves. So, if it is particles through which this energy is propagating, it becomes a particulate radiation. And if it uh, 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 transmits or uh, propagates in a wave fashion, wherein it is uh, interaction between energy and matter, uh, surrounding matter, it becomes an electromagnetic radiation. Now, within the particulate radiation, we have uh, various number of particle, various particles which are known uh, to mankind. The most common, uh, uh, the most common ones are these beta particles or cathode rays, both of which consists of electrons. Again, uh, depending upon the uh, source from which it is uh, produced. Now, beta particles, it is from a nucleus of a radioactive uh, uh, atom, whereas cathode rays, it is the most important rays uh, for a dental physician because these are the cathode rays are seen in an X-ray tube. Now, other one is an alpha particle. Now, alpha particle is a more heavier kind of particle. It is basically two uh, protons and uh, two neutrons. So, it is a, a, a four uh, come to uh, particle, which is a heavier particle. Now, uh, that is an, uh, it is uh, emitted from the nucleus of heavy metals. Now, the other kind is the protons. Now, now when this proton is basically a hydrogen nucleus, is uh, basically an hydrogen uh, atom which has lost an electron, now that becomes a proton. Now, neutrons, as you know, it is a, a no charge particle which has ma mass of 1 and it is a, a accelerated particles with a heavier mass than compared to other particles. Now, depending upon the weight of these particles and depending upon the uh, size of these particles, the penetrating power is directly proportional. Now, if you see the alpha particle, as I told, it is emitted from a, a nucleus of a heavy metal and it is more heavier when compared to other particles. You can see how the penetrating power is inversely proportional. The heavier the particle, less is the penetrating power. Now, you can see neutron has a, a, a slight a lightest amount, a lightest mass, whereas alpha particle is the more, most heaviest uh, kind of uh, uh, particle. Uh, so, depending upon that, it is the penetrating power is inversely proportional as you can see in this schematic diagram. No, so more that being the particulate radiation, the next is the electromagnetic radiation. Now, electromagnetic radiation is nothing but a wave-like energy without any mass, uh, contrary to particulate radiation, which transmits or propagates through space or matter. Now, examples of all these are gamma rays, X rays, UV rays. It is a broad spectrum uh, upon which a various number of electromagnetic radiations are uh, seen, among which the most important one the most important uh, or useful to the dental physician is the x-rays. Now, you can see uh, the electromagnetic spectrum which is arranged uh, depending upon increasing wavelength or uh, decreasing frequency. You can see how from the left side to the right side as the spectrum goes on, the wavelength of the uh, particles gradually decreases and the frequency increases. Now, we all know uh, how wavelength and frequency are related, it is inversely proportional. So, the greater the wavelength of a, a radiation, less is the frequency. Now, the less is the frequency, less is the energy of the part of the radiation and less energy means less amount of penetrating power. Now, as we can see from uh, left to right, we can see how the wavelength of the uh, uh, radiations uh, gradually decrease, the frequency gradually increases and hence the energy also increases. So, what are X-rays? So, uh, X-rays as you know, it is a part of an electromagnetic radiation. So, they are basically weightless. They are only packets of energy. So, that is the definition of X-rays. The weightless bundles of energy which are seen without any electrical charge and they travel through space at the speed of light. Now, all these uh, electromagnetic radiations, as I said, they are uh, totally weightless. They are basically enclosed packets of energy or uh, enclosed packets of energy, in other words, called as photons. They are ba basically quantum, uh, according to the quantum theory, they are basically packets of energy or photons which transmit in this, uh, propagate through space or matter. Now, the four types of X-rays, depending upon the frequency and the wavelength of, uh, of these X-rays, now depending upon the wavelength, its frequency depends upon and depending upon the frequency, the energy also depends upon and according to which there are four types of uh, X-rays. And as you can see, it is between 0.5 to 0.1 uh, Armstrongs. Uh, the X-rays which fall in this third category are the most useful for uh, a dental practice or uh, from the medical point of view as such. They are the most uh, useful uh, for both diagnostic 
as well as superficial therapy. So the next principle which is useful for the production of X-rays and how these X-rays are useful in producing an image upon an X-ray film is a linear energy transfer. Now as I said the various particulate uh, radiations which we see uh, which, we know, uh, which are known to the mankind depending upon the weight of these particles the penetrating power uh, is uh, inversely proportional as I already told. Now why it is so? Now heavier the particle, the heavier the uh, interaction of this particle with the surrounding structures that is to say uh, alpha particle and a neutron if you take the sizes of these uh, particles as you know alpha particle is much more heavier and a bigger particle and as it uh, goes through propagates through a, sp a certain space or matter its interaction with the surrounding structures is more and hence big, because it is an ionizing radiation also it because of its uh, uh, interaction with the surrounding matter the energy which is uh, contained within this particle is given out to the surrounding structures and it, uh, the surrounding area becomes ionized. So that is called the ionizing power or the linear energy transfer power. So if you take a heavier particle, the linear energy transfer is more. Now since the energy of the particle is continuously lost at a drastic rate as it goes through uh, space or matter, the distance uh, to which it can travel is far more less because it uh, greatly dis dissipates its energy to the surrounding structures. Now contrary is the case with a smaller particle like neutron. So we have uh, two kinds of uh, particles with high LET and low LET. As I said high LET, heavier particles like alpha dis, uh, particles, it uh, spreads, out, uh, spreads out its uh, energy to the surrounding areas much more faster and much more greater. Hence it travels for a shorter distance and hence more damage. Now we will be talking about the radiation biology later. but the basic principle uh, upon which uh, the damage to the surrounding tissues is done is up, uh, dependent upon the LED of that particular particle. The greater amount of energy which it uh, dissipates to the surrounding areas, greater is the damage to the surrounding areas. So these alpha particles are not normally used for diagnostic purpose since it does not have any sufficient penetrating power. It does not travel the uh, total distance as we would like and there is greater amount of damage to the surrounding areas. Now contrary, X-rays have a low LET. Now they uh, travel for a longer distance because of its less uh, linear energy transfer power, because of its less uh, lesser amount of dissipation of energy to the surrounding areas, greater distances are traveled by X-rays. Now the, more, the recent or the most accepted uh, X-ray tube uh, presently in use is a Coolidge tube which was designed by Coolidge. Now the basic principle or the schematic representation of this tube is given over here wherein it is the total X-ray tube is enclosed within a glass uh, envelope. Now gl this glass envelope has a cathode with a tungsten filament from which the basic the cloud of electrons are uh, generated. Now these uh, electrons are then uh, transferred to an anode with a focal spot. The focal spot is again made of uh, tungsten with specific pro properties embedded in a copper uh, stem. Now this uh, an uh, cathode is uh, basically connected to a step down transformer which creates the necessary potential which creates a cloud of electrons near the cathode. Now the focusing cup which we can see over here the focusing cup basically what it does is it concentrates this electron uh, uh, cloud to a specific area from which these speed uh, electrons are speeded up and uh, they are made to hit the opposite area that is the anode structure. Now all this is uh, the uh, voltage potential is uh, maintained, high amount of voltage potential is maintained so that these uh, electrically charged uh, electrons can transfer from the cathode to the anode. Now as you can see after these electrons hit the uh, anode the tungsten uh, target these tungsten uh, this at this point your x-rays are produced and that is focused out through a window. So what are the properties of the co constants of a cathode? It basically consists of a uh, tungsten t uh, filament which is basically responsible for producing this electron uh, cloud and it also has a focusing cusp. Now this tungsten uh, uh, filament is uh, basically uh, a process through which a process called as thermionic emission of uh, emis uh, electrons that is because of the heat generated these electrons are released out from its respective atoms and then there is a focusing cusp 
cus uh, cup which is a molybdenum uh, based uh, cup it basically what it does it it uh, gathers this focuses uh, all these uh, electron clouds to a specific area from which these electrons are speeded up because of the uh, potential difference now these electrons go and hit to the opposite side that is at the anode it uh, again uh, as i said it basically consists of two components one is your uh, tungsten focus spot and another is a copper stem now that this tungsten uh, focus spot uh, have uh, white tungsten is used as an anode uh, it depends upon the uh, the properties a few specific properties of uh, tungsten that is it has an high atomic number it has a high melting point since there is a lot of heat which is generated within an x-ray tube the anode has to uh, sustain this uh, particular heat and it shouldn't melt in the x-ray tube hence tungsten is used because of its high melting point also for the same uh, reason a uh, low uh, vapor pressure material is uh, preferred and again tungsten fulfills these uh, requirements now this is uh, generally 1 mm into 3 mm and uh, because of the uh, uh, great amount of heat which is produced within an x-ray tube this heat can be derogatory to the type of uh, uh, image quality which we uh, get so to dissipate this particular heat from that particular area at a rapid rate we need a uh, material which can uh, transmit or uh, take out this heat from that particular area at a faster rate hence your copper stem over here which is a good uh, electric very good uh, conductor of uh, heat and it dissipates the energy or heat over there now this is the uh, this is the classical x-ray uh, tube or the coolest uh, coolest tube which is uh, used the uh, the top picture which we uh, see over here is a uh, total enclosed compact x-ray tube and if we take out the various parts we can see the cathode the filament and the anode the tungsten filament within the uh, tungsten uh, focus spot within the copper stem and the glass envelope now the depending upon the type of uh, x ray or a type of film which we uh, take or depending upon the usage of this particular x rays there are different types of anodes which we use broadly classified as stationary anodes and rotating anodes the basic difference between a stationary anode and rotatory anode as the name suggests is the stability or the uh, single position or multiple positions as seen in a rotating anode now if you see the rotating anode the basic principle or the basic use of uh, rotating the anode is focusing the uh, uh, beam of electrons at different areas or different spots on the anode uh, on, on the anode plane at different times now this is specifically used for high voltage or uh, heavy equipment heavy x ray equipment like tomographic or cephalometric units which is which gives a great amount of uh, heat as compared to normal iops or intraoral x rays so to dissipate this uh, energy at a faster rate at a better a better efficiency and to produce and to not compromise on the quality of film this anode keeps rotating which helps in uh, focusing this heat spots uh, gained from this uh, stream of electrons at different areas hence giving time for the different areas other areas to recoup or dissipate the energy hence it also prolongs the uh, longevity of the x-ray tube the next uh, principle upon which these x-ray tubes and x-ray films are uh, based upon is the line focus principle now the basic what uh, the basic uh, principle which we have to remember is a larger focus spot there is greater amount of heat loading that is greater amount of efficient heat uh, dissipation whereas a smaller focus spot gives the rise to sharper images now in an x ray film we need both sharper images as well as we also need to take care of the uh, efficiency or the longevity of the x ray tube so what we uh, try to do is we try to strike a balance between both of them and we come up with an optimum uh, focus spot which which will give uh, sufficient uh, radiographic details as well as not cause any harm to the x ray tube now how is this done this is done by line focus principle the line focus principle if you see the schematic representation now we see that the anode which is placed within the x-ray tube it is at an angle now why this angle is uh, given to the anode now if the stream of electrons which come from the cathode to the anode because of the angulation the actual focal spot is larger in area but when it 
converges through the window and it actually produces the beam through uh, from which the x-ray film is produced there is a convergence of these areas starting up from the edges of this anode they converge to a specific point which is much smaller than the actual focal spot so because of the angulation which is given uh, the actual focal spot is much more bigger than the re, uh, than the uh, effective focal spot which is which actually produces the image is much more smaller so we uh, take in both considerations because of the larger actual uh, uh, focal spot there is better amount of uh, e efficient uh, heat uh, loss or heat dissipation at the same time because of the angulation we also have a, have a effective focus focus spot which is much more smaller than the actual uh, uh, focus spot thereby giving rise to sharper images so because this is the basic uh, idea behind this angulation and that is called the line focus principle you can see how the actual focal spot is around 3 mm in uh, dimensions and because of the angulation that, that is around 17 to 20 degrees this convergence of these uh, uh, rays and the effective focal spot is just about 1 mm so we uh, have taken into consideration both the heat loss consideration as well as the sharper image details so in the production of x-rays basically what we know uh, have to know is it is just breaking or uh, stoppage of high energy electrons which produces this x-rays now how this is produced because of the collisions between the electrons starting from the cathode and hitting at the anode there is heat producing collisions as well as x-ray produ uh, producing collisions now these x-ray producing uh, collisions can be of two types one is the bremsstrom radiation and the other one is a characteristic radiation what is bremsstrom radiation it is basically a, a german word uh, which is indicates breaking radiation what we are what are we breaking over here it is b r a k i n g that is we are stopping the high energy electrons suddenly now how are we stopping if you see at see this diagram over here now whenever a photon or an electron from the outside that is uh, in the that is a cathode in this uh, context hits the uh, anode atoms there might be two reactions one it might just hit the uh, nucleus straight away or it might go and nearly miss that uh, particular uh, nucleus and now in both scenarios wherein the electrons come and hit either the nucleus or it nearly misses the uh, nucleus and changes its uh, direction there is loss of energy now this loss of energy is, is uh, converted into x-rays that is uh, the bremsstrom radiation now because of this altered path of electron there is change in the uh, uh, electrons energy there is loss of energy uh, compared to a direct hit where is there is total loss here in a indirect or a near miss interaction there is a partial loss of energy so here in this case we have an x-ray of higher energy and in this case we have an x-ray of a lower energy so as i told bremsstrom radiation is nothing but breaking a radiation and with, uh, this is uh, uh, a dominant part in the total x-ray spectra wherein it plays up to 70% of the, all the x-ray emissions the other uh, lesser dominant uh, less uh, dominant type of radiation that is a characteristic radiation which accounts for only 30% of the to uh, total photons x-ray photons and that is because of the uh, ionization of that uh, atom or the uh, present at the anode now we can see when when we have the incident radiation from the primary x-rays that is the cathode in this uh, in this instance it hits the outer electrons in various shells be it the k l or m uh, shells and displaces that particular electron from that orbit so what it's basically doing it's is creating a void in the inner uh, inner uh, areas or the inner orbits wherein because of this uh, uh, high speed electrons the the electrons already within the orbit are displaced out creating a void creating an energy difference they were creating an ion actually now ions as we know as are uh, unstable they are more reactive so atom what it does it it tries to uh, gain back its stable structure by bringing out an electron from the higher orbits into the lower orbit now atom always tries to uh, attain a stable state 
by reducing the amount of energy, the total uh, binding energy of the atom. So in this case wherein we have a void in the inner shells or the inner orbits, obviously the electrons in the outer orbits have a high, uh, bind, higher binding energy. Now by bringing in the outer uh, electron, it is bringing the electron to the, uh, to the closer orbits, thereby reducing the binding energy. Now this uh, difference in binding energy is released out as a characteristic X-ray radiation or a photon. Now that is a characteristic photon or characteristic radiation. Now consequently it is a cycle. Now since uh, for example the uh, incident rays knocks out a K-shell uh, K uh, electron that is the most innermost uh, electron, the orbit next to it that is a L uh, electron jumps into the K-shell uh, thereby again creating a void in the L-shell. Now this uh, L-shell void is again filled up by the subsequent uh, uh, orbit uh, electron in the next orbit that is a M-shell thereby there is another M electron which jumps into the L uh, orbit thereby uh, reducing the total uh, energy to a far more minimal than uh, its uh, predecessors. This is a schematic representation where you can see uh, if we denote the numbers as 1, 2, 3 to the uh, subsequent uh, orbits, this uh, loss of uh, electrons from the innermost orbit uh, promotes the other subsequent electron to jump to the inner, uh, inner orbits, thereby releasing out characteristic radiation. So what are the properties of X-rays? As, as I said, this is an electromagnetic radiation. So they're basically packets of energy. They travel at a straight lines with the speed of light. They obey the inverse square law. Now what this inverse square law, I'll be talking about a little later. There's no medium required for propagation because there's basically energies. There's uh, energy packets which are uh, uh, propagating. They can be attenuated by matter. As I said, that is the basic uh, principle upon which we get radio opaque or radiolucent images, the stoppage of these uh, X-rays by more dense uh, objects or matter, capable of producing ionization as we have already seen, undetectable by human senses, invisible hence the name itself that is X-rays which was uh, denoting the invisible nature of these rays, cannot be reflected, refracted or uh, deflected. So what are the various factors uh, which result in the final quality of the beam? They're basically uh, divided into six important factors upon which with the quality of beam, beam is, X-ray beam is determined. The starting from your exposure time given in milliseconds, tube current given in milliamperes, kilo voltage uh, denoted by the letter V, the filtration capability of the X-ray tube, the collimation uh, quality of the X-ray tube and last but not the least is the inverse square law. Now, how these various factors affect the quality of the beam, I'll be talking about. First, coming over to the uh, exposure time. Now, as you know, uh, the longer the time uh, it is exposed, the greater is the uh, length of time for which there is uh, a potential difference. So, greater number of electrons uh, from the cathode hit the anode. So, greater amount of or the quantity of these photons which are produced from the anode increases. So basically the quantity of X-rays or the number of photons increases when we increase the time. Now what happens when there is increase in the uh, milliamperage or the current? The same thing, the uh, greater amount of uh, current generated, greater amount of electrons which are dissipated from the uh, cathode run toward the anode, thereby producing greater number of photons. So again because of the increase in MA or increase in the current of the X-ray tube, there is again quantity, quantitative increase in the number of uh, photons which are produced from the anode. Now what is the case when we increase the voltage? Now as we know the voltage basically gives uh, the energy difference or the higher the uh, voltage difference between the cathode and the anode, greater is the speed with which the electrons move. Now the greater uh, uh, the speed with which the electron moves, the greater is the energy loss subsequently at the anode. Now greater is the energy loss greater is the energy of the photons which are released from the anodes. Hence, because of the increase in the voltage, there is not only in, uh, incre uh, there is not only an increase in the number of photons, that is quantitatively, there is also increase in the energy of these photons, that is qualitative increase also. We can see in this, uh, 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 this uh, diagram, 
when we we take two uh, different uh, scenarios wherein uh, uh, we have a lower ma uh, scenario that is around 10 uh, milliamperes and a higher ma uh, scenario with uh, doubling the current we can see how on the x axis wherein the photon energy is donated uh, denoted and the uh, y axis wherein the number of electrons is denoted we can see there is no difference between the end point and the starting point that is to say the energy of these uh, photons remains same even though there is doubling of the ma there is only increase in the number of electrons as we can is denoted by the area which is enclosed between these two pyramids there is only increase in the number of uh, photons that is to say there is quantitative increase only now the, on, the, on the other hand if we see this, these two scenarios where there is doubling of the voltage now since the, the voltage is increased we can see on the x axis the photon energy increases drastically because of the increase in the voltage at the same time we also see that the number of the peak of the pyramid which denotes the number of uh, peak number of uh, uh, photons which are uh, uh, generated we can see that there is also an uh, increase in the number of elect uh, photons or electrons also. So what we are seeing is because of the increase in the voltage, there is not only quantitative increase, there is also qualitative increase in the uh, photon energy. The other principle upon which uh, the quality of the beam uh, depends upon is the filtration capability of the X-ray tube. Now what a filtration basically uh, means removal of low energy photons. As we said, there is a spectra. Uh, depending upon whether it is a brimstone radiation or a characteristic radiation there is a spectra of uh, photons uh, photonic energies which are released out and carried out uh, uh, which translates as uh, x-rays with different spectra of energies but the the, but the problem with uh, the different uh, uh, spectra of energies is the energies which uh, lie in the middle uh, mid part neither uh, too low energies nor too high energies only those photons are useful for, as a diagnostic x -ray, for diagnostic uh, x-ray purpose the low ele uh, energy electrons as well as very high electrons do not play a part in the uh, formation of an image so it is essential to remove these low energy photons so as to also minimize the tissue damage or also minimize the exposure of the patient this filtration is important we can see how and heterochromatic x-ray beam that is to say the various spectra of energies of the x-ray beams is uh, seen uh, uh, from the anode uh, once it uh, pro, uh, once it is produced from the anode and an aluminum filter is used in this uh, x-ray tube and we can see how longer wavelength uh, x-ray beams uh, as I already told that uh, X-ray beams having a longer wavelength will have lesser frequency thereby lesser energy. So these are low energy uh, X-ray beams which you are seeing over here with longer wavelength. So these longer wavelength uh, rays are totally stopped by the filtration and only a monochromatic uh, X-ray beam that is with a specific energy is transmitted through the filtration and that is only used as a uh, di for diagnostic X-ray purposes. So the filtration basically within an X-ray tube and outside the X-ray tube is basically divided into two. One is the inherent filtration which is provided by the glass envelope itself and also the insulating oil which surrounds this X-ray equipment which is an uh, equivalent of 0.2 mm of aluminum. And there is also an added extra uh, filtration disc or aluminum disc. Now this aluminum disc thickness depends upon the type of X-ray unit which we are working with. Now, if it is a, a X-ray unit uh, used for internal X-ray purposes, that is around 70 kVp, that is a peak voltage. Only 1.5 mm of aluminum is used. Now, for cephalometric and tomographic units, we use a higher voltage, that is around more than uh, 70, reaching up to 100 kVp, wherein we uh, have a 2.5 mm of uh, aluminum disc. So, the next important factor upon which the quality of X-ray beam depends upon is collimation. Now the word collimation basically uh, denotes a restriction in the size and the shape of the beam. Now we all know that the uh, X-ray be uh, beams or the X-ray photons which are produced at the anode, they are of different intensities, different energies and they travel at different uh, directions in different angles. 
but all these uh, x-ray beams traveling at different directions is not needed for uh, to produce an image quality of sharpness as well as image quality which is restricted in size so if we have to take an uh, x-ray image of one particular size we need to have uh, all the x-ray beams useful x-ray beams uh, uh, projected only to that specific area and not outside this area thereby what we are doing is not only increasing the sharpness of the image of the x-ray film but also decreasing unnecessary tissue exposure to the surrounding areas which are not needed so basically uh, in reducing the size and the shape we are reducing the tissue exposure thereby better patient protection and also reducing the secondary radiation thereby uh, producing better image quality we can see how in a collimation there is a small uh, a hole through which all these x-rays are uh, directed towards to now depending upon the uh, uh, unit which we are using an internal or an external unit and depending upon the shape of these uh, collimators they are basically defined as uh, classified as a round collimator or a rectangular collimator now the other the most important factor upon which uh, this x-ray quality uh, depends upon is the inverse square law now what this inverse square law uh, denotes is intensity of an x-ray beam at one specific point of time at one specific point is inversely proportional to the distance between that point and the x-ray source now if i denotes the intensity d denotes the distance uh, from the source they, they are uh, i is inversely propor proportional to the square of this distance that is to say if we take this uh, schematic uh, diagram if we take this r this, uh, uh, distance the r is the distance from the source and 3r is the uh, uh, distance from this source we can see how the more number of x rays that is to say the intensity of these x rays is more at this particular point wherein the same area or the same uh, uh, specific point of uh, a sp same uh, area of this uh, 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 th at this point if translated through uh, to 3r distance we see only couple of uh, x rays through that particular beam so is to so as to say the as the distance increases the square of this distance is inversely proportional to the intensity of the x-ray beam from the source to that particular point now the other uh, component that is a timer as you know it is uh, uh, the most uh, important other most important uh, component that is to denote the uh, exposure time to which uh, uh, time to which we are exposing the patient to the x-ray beam now it should be accurate is it should be consistent and should have a wide range depending upon the usage of these x-ray beams be it intraoral or uh, external usages now they are both mechanical and electronic depending upon the different uh, types of sets which we wherein we use this timers now the after these x rays are produced uh, from the anode the how this x rays interact with the matter outside it you know the uh, interaction of these x rays with the surrounding area or the surrounding matter is most important as to because it translates directly into the image quality image uh, resolution or image sharpness of the x-ray film which we intend to take now these x-rays uh, interact with uh, the matter in four different ways that is your coherent scattering the photoelectric absorption the compton uh, effect as well as the pair production so what is this coherent scattering to put it in simple terms it's basically when the uh, photon or the x-ray photon interacts with the surrounding uh, matters atoms it basically hits the uh, uh, electron in the outermost shell now this electron takes up all the energy of the x-ray photon it doesn't move from its place but it uh, temporarily vibrates in its uh, particular position and thereby after the cessation of this uh, vibration equal amount of energy is again uh, given out at a different angulation uh, with an energy which is equivalent to the x-ray photon which it has uh, which has bombarded it in the first place so there is no loss of energy and there is just uh, no loss of uh, electron from its uh, space uh, place it is just temporary vibration and again releasing out this photon at a different angulation so that being your coherent scattering it just uh, uh, accounts for very minimal amount of uh, scattering which is seen because of the interaction between x-rays and matter around, around about 6% of the total interactions 
the most uh, important or the most of uh, uh, important kind of scattering which accounts for around 60% of all the scattering is a photoelectric absorption now put to put it in a schematic uh, uh, pre uh, purview the this being your incident x-ray photon now that knocks out a particular uh, uh, electron from the innermost shell and this is the knocked out electron now as i said the characteristic radiation uh, comes into play over here now because of the void which is left out uh, uh, by this electron which is pushed out by the incident x-ray photon the electron from the outer orbit jumps into this uh, inner void and because of the energy difference or because of the difference in the binding energy this energy is translated into a characteristic radiation at a, from a different point at a different angle so that uh, being the typical uh, point, uh, typical uh, feature of uh, photoelectric absorption, wherein this photoelectric uh, interaction uh, results in the production of characteristic radiation. Now, the other most important uh, type of uh, scattering is a Compton effect, wherein if you see the incident photon basically bombards the uh, electron from the outermost shell, and what happens is there is a recall el uh, uh, electron, that is the electron which is in the outermost orbit it is uh, recoiled at a different angle with a different speed and at the same time there is also a scattered photon which is uh, in uh, which uh, goes in the totally opposite direction to that of a recoil electron so what hap uh, what's happening is the energy of the incident photon is divided two ways in two split ways one the energy which is possessed by this recoil electron and the and other energy of the scattered photon basically this scattered photon has an energy which is far more less than the incident photon so basically it is a secondary radiation which is of less diagnostic importance now the last interaction is a pair production this totally follows the einstein's law where is total transformation of uh, this interaction between the energy as well as the mass so what's happening is there is a high energy photon which is bombarded and the to photon totally disappears and what happens is it produces two particles that is your electron and a positron and we all know that uh, electron and positron are uh, uh, to, uh, positron is the opposite of an electron so it has a uh, totally opposite charge is it has a positive charge and an electron has a negative charge so basically the charges are uh, getting uh, nullified and the total mass is divided between this electron and positron with total dip disappearance of the uh, incident photon the last part of uh, today's discussion is dosimetry and the uh, various uh, terms of uh, dose uh, related terms which are used uh, over here so basically what is the dosimetry is determining the quantity of radiation exposure or dose is basically dosimetry the various terms upon which uh, this radiation is uh, explained the uh, the first of it is dose now dose is nothing but amount of energy which is absorbed per unit mass now that is a dose uh, definition of dose the next is the exposure now exposure is nothing but the capability of this radi radiation to ionize the air now if you have a high uh, let that is linear energy transfer particle we say the exposure of the uh, person or the patient is much more why primarily because it has a higher let wherein there is a greater amount of energy dissipation so there is a probability of greater amount of damage Hence, we say the patient is exposed to a greater radiation than uh, compared to another particle which has a lower LAT. Now, the SI unit of this exposure is air karma or uh, given in a grays. One grays is 100 rads. Uh, rad or uh, ronjan is nothing but the traditional unit. Now, ronjan it is defined as the quantity of X-ray radiation or gamma radiation which produces a specific amount of charge in the surrounding matter. Now that charge is 2.58 into 10 power minus 4 uh, coulombs per kg. Now this uh, uh, ability of this radiation to give a specific charge to the surrounding area, the amount of radiation which is required to produce this amount of charge uh, for a, a specific weight of area, weight of air that is 1 kg of air, is determines the exposure capability as well uh, in terms of Ronjan. Now there is absorbed dose and equivalent dose. Absorbed dose is basically nothing but as the name denotes it is the energy absorbed uh, by any any uh, matter of a specific type of ionizing radiation. The SI unit again is gray and uh, as I said one gray is 100 rads. 
the equivalent dose on the other side it is used to compare the biological effects of that specific ionizing radiation on the various tissues in a given body now this is uh, more important in radiation biological uh, terms wherein there is uh, the susceptibility of the various tissues of the human body is different for a specific radiation now this is uh, given by a mathematical uh, equation that is absorbed dose into the weighting factor depending upon the tissue upon which it is instant upon now the si unit uh, being sieverts over here one sievert is 100 rems this effective dose that is uh, totally used to estimate the total risk to a human being so taken into consideration all the equivalent doses all the uh, equivalent dose as uh, given over here taking into consideration all the tissues uh, which is a uh, uh, which are exposed to the specific uh, radiation that into the tissue weighting factor so equivalent dose into tissue uh, weighting factor gives a total risk to the uh, uh, probability of risk to the human being that is being your uh, effective dose now the last one being your radioactivity it is nothing but uh, the decay rate of a sample of radioactive uh, uh, material as you all know radioactive materials are nothing but unstable uh, molecules or atoms which have a higher energy and they continuously emit out uh, particulate uh, radiations uh, they uh, to in a final effort to uh, uh, bring back that uh, radioactive uh, unstable atom to a more stable uh, position. So this decay rate of any sample of radioactive material is nothing but your radioactivity. Uh, the SI unit being Becquerel uh, uh, named after the uh, its uh, discoverer. So one Becquerel is uh, 2.710 power minus 11 curies. Now that brings us uh, to the end of uh, the physics governing the radiation and also the dosimeter and the various terms used in radiological uh, perspective. Thank you.